Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, you'll see a little, little link down below. You can click on it. You'll end up in Zoom, and then you'll see a little link down below, and you go to Mukana, and that's where you can actually ask questions and uh, and talk to everybody and ha have chats and, uh, and just bring up the things that you're trying to figure out. So anything that you have within media and virtual production, you can ask questions there. Um, so uh, make sure to come all the way over. I know you're watching on YouTube. Uh, if you're, uh, and again, if you're in Zoom, come on all the way over into Makana and ask those questions. Uh, if you think you can answer the questions, we'd love to have you uh, come early. Uh, so 6.40 a.m. is when we start doing uh, mic checks. Uh, and uh, so come in early and uh, get checked up, make sure you're ready to go. If you're not sure you're ready to go, um, start at, we'll start at six o'clock. We open the doors uh, and you can come in then. Um, we, first hour is general Q&A. Second hour is something specific. Today, we're going to be talking, Richard Mueller's got a bunch of HDR monitors and uh, we're going to be um, uh, looking at those HDR monitors and talking about what he's going through as he tests them. So it should be really interesting. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about really the, the challenges and how we solve digital first events, which I think are going to be a big part of a lot of our futures. And then on Friday, um, of course, we're, we're going into AWS Part 2, which AWS Part 1 just rocked the, rocked the house. <laughs> so, so it's going to be really fun to see what we have in Part 2. Saturday, of course, is the long day. You now we're going to have uh, education, then resolve. And then we're going to have an introduction uh, from a special guest talking about Arduinos. So um, we are going to still do some more Raspberry Pi, but we're going to have an open discussion about what we'd like to learn um, about Arduinos. So stay tuned for that. All right, uh, Bill, let's go ahead and take it away. Okay, our first question this morning is from Jonas Dartel of Reutlingen, Germany, and who is leading one of those discussions. Alex, are you able to share the statistics of the eight-hour Saturday session, particularly retention, average view duration, and so forth? You know, I I, I, I only have uh, informal data. I haven't really dug through the data very much, but in general, there's about 130 viewers uh, and I believe there were about 30 people that were in the panel. And of those, there were somewhere between 15 and 20 that had multi-camera capability. So, um, you know, that's kind of what we've, uh, that's I, that's all I was kind of tracking during the during those hours. We have to remember that that was seven hours, seven through 10 of that day, which was kind of impressive. Um, and um, so I, those are the numbers that that I saw going by. I haven't really dug into the numbers any deeper um, than that. So, um, so anyway, so that's, that's what I, um, that's what we saw so far. Um, as a test, again, I, it was, it was amazing. And, and what we're going to do is one of the things we were talking about in the pre pre show is that we're probably going to do it again. So, um, we'll put out, we'll put out a link, uh, probably tomorrow with the, with the morning agenda. Um, but we're probably going to do it a, a, a second time from scratch for all of you that missed it. <laughs> um, not this Saturday, but probably next Saturday. Uh, so anybody who wants to jump in and actually be part of it, we're going to give you a, another chance. But what's cool about it is, is that a lot of us have already done it. So it'll be a slightly different thing because you'll have some folks who uh, already went through the path. Um, and it's kind of a test that that I want to have about how much more efficient it might be. Um, then we're looking at for the next couple of weeks while we get ready for the Arduino work, we're looking at um, doing some additional projects inside the Raspberry Pi. So what we're kind of playing with right now is having – um, no promises yet, but I think that this is what we're discussing at the moment is, is the first hour of each one of these will be how to build your Raspberry Pi with, my, with, a, with a couple of us here so that you can build it. And then it'll be, okay, now here's how to do a, a tally light, or here's how to um, build a companion, or here's how to do something else. So the rest of it will be for, will be new, but the first hour will be the, here's how to build your computer. So, um, so I think that that's kind of where we're kind of leaning towards, um, coming up for the next couple of weeks. Um, and then, we are pretty sure that we're going to move to, uh, you know, talking more about Arduinos. Um, I think that in general, we're going to do a lot of labs. I think this is going to be a, uh, uh, we, we, we think that this is a pretty interesting possibility. So we're, we're trying to figure out how, what, what the pace of those will be and, and what the subject matter is. So, um, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, next question. Mark Tur uh, from Truro, and no last name or C beyond that, I have a normal paid meetings Zoom account. What's the cheapest way to get Zoom to give me 720p video? Go ahead, Guy. Well, the cheapest way would be to ask and receive from Zoom support. That would be free, um, but I, it's very tough to get right now. Um, the next step would be a portal, which I think uh, Leo was just holding up. Is that a portal? So there's the eight inches, the cheapest one. Next is the Echo Show, the new one. Uh, it's the eight uh, or is it the 10 or eight. There's a, there's a brand new one that has a, a screen, uh, which I've tested and confirmed works. 
Uh, One More Way is a project that uh, Jonas from Playout B and I are working on. It's meetingmeters.com, which just looks like some meters from Ulean, which is actually a G4DN instance running in the cloud. Uh, It just happens to be running on a Zoom room, and uh, Zoom rooms will also do the bump. And so if you go to Meeting Meters and enter in your your meeting ID right now, uh, it'll, it'll be a Zoom room that comes and visits you. So it does a bump for free. So that might be the cheapest way currently. There you go. Uh, next question. Uh, the next question comes to us from Nigel Dessau of Austin, Texas. Why do Why do you think people are scared to join the panel? Yeah, go ahead, Leo. So I don't think it's about being scared. I think it's about what you want to get in and what you want to put back. Um, and that also sounds a ne- bit negative, but it's not meant to be. Uh, Some people work in a different way. Some people are audio, some people are visual, and some people absorb by listening and putting in questions in writing. Um, I don't think that's a problem. I think we shouldn't... This is the the year when we have learnt that what we thought was the right way of doing things and the tried and tested method of everything was to do it this way, that we actually found that we can do things in a different way and that sometimes that works better for some people and it doesn't for others. Go ahead, Chris, and then Bill. I think it's analogous to uh, sitting in a room in a in a physical meeting. There are people that are going to sit in the front row. Um, there's people that are going to raise their hand all the time. There's people that sit toward the back. And then there's people that lean against the back wall. Um, and then there's always people that just never come in. Uh, but but different people react differently. I do think it's an intimidating group. I, I don't think we realize how intimidating it is. And I think it would take a lot of us having a lot of deep psychological profiling to figure out all the things we do wrong. But I think we're, I think we are intimidating. It'd be nice if we weren't, but that's the reality. Talk of it. it a bunch. Let's talk it a bunch. Yeah, go ahead, Bill, and then Sky. Decades ago, I saw research that said clear in a way the number one public anxiety causer or fear was public speaking. This is, I think, public speaking on steroids in the minds of many, many people. So I just think that's a natural barrier for people to get over. It's anxiety causing. Go go ahead, uh, Sky, and then Jan, and then John. Two words that come to mind are value and trust. The value for this group for me is that I, I need to learn what you, you are doing. I am pivoting in my world, in my life, at this time in my life, and I need that information. So value to me is I'm, I'm willing to risk the shame or the humiliation or, or Chris Finwick laughing at me. What? He would. But anyway, he, because he's laughing with me. And that, again, I credit to Alex for creating a nutrient-rich environment in keeping a discipline for a forward progressive reason, not for a you know, putting something down and the truck. Well, that's the, that's the trust concept. And I guess I do bring 14,000, uh, performances on stage. So as far as being an extrovert in a crowd, yeah, I can be an introvert too, because I've got my dangly cable hanging over. So I, there's always a, there's a value for the individual. What is in it for me, but then there's also a trust that has been created in this environment over a long period of time. So practice, practice, practice. Go ahead, uh, Jan, and then Ken. What? And give up showbiz? Anyway, um, I'm curious more why people are not watching us on YouTube rather than sit as an attendee if they don't want to participate. Any idea why people are not watching us more on YouTube? I think that, yeah, it's it's, a, it's technically more in real time you know, because it's, uh, the last, it's 12 seconds that people I think are attached to. It's also higher resolution in, in, in here than it is. And I think for some reason you feel like you're more in the room than, than you do in YouTube, in, in my opinion. But, but those are my, my two cents. So Ken and then John. Yes, uh, being as a relatively recent panelist, um, coming on initially, because listening to the um, sort of pre-show, and at times there, it was like knowing when to kind of wanting to interrupt so that I could, you know, test my setup and stuff. And I think sometimes in the pre-show, when there's a very long kind of conversation, not necessarily about, you know, setup, it can be 
oh, should I interrupt? These guys are in the all know. And, and because we're sitting in front of everyone right now, what I will say is the ab- mm-hmm. answer is absolutely. Like like the, 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 main, the main existence of the pre-show, we fill the pre-show with us chit-chatting. The reason to have the pre-show is to do checks so yeah. so we i apologize that that we don't say that more often but but the whole existence of it if, if, if all we did was checks all from 6 a.m to 6 40 i'd be happy so um know that that's that's, that's the, why i brought it the yeah. Goal. yeah i know i knew that that's why i brought it up here so that yeah, yeah. no i'm glad, I'm glad you brought it up wouldn't know I'm glad you brought it up. okay yeah yeah no it's, it's for, perfect for perfect. the record when you say pre-show do you mean at five o'clock or at six no 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 <laughs> no 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 the the pre pre show, like that's the first breakfast, the pre pre show, that's just us hanging out. So we aren't, we, we, we're happy to look at your, we do do a lot of experimentation. We were playing with John's mic for like, I don't know, 20 minutes, like, you know, of, of comparing things. The, the pre pre show is a very slow content. Like we're all kind of waking up and, and we're all just kind of like talking and there's kind of this free flowing is it's, it, it slowly picks up pace until we get to here. Okay. We're going to move pretty fast when I come to you because we've taken this one for a while, uh, John and then Stuart and then Leo, and then we'll move on. Oh, I, again, Alex, you're playing the role of the teacher and monitor and moderator. And mm-hmm. what I think happens here is, you know, some people, it's hard to get in. So the new, new kid comes to this classroom. How do you engage them? And we, there are certain people who bring out other people. It's been fun to watch this, analyze it on how this impacts online yep. teaching, because you have to have people feel invited. You have to figure out how to tone down people like me who might be going on too long. <laughs> Stuart, and then, and then Leo. Yeah, just to Jan's point, there are two reasons why people would watch here instead of on YouTube. Firstly, YouTube has ads, Zoom doesn't. And frankly, the audio is more consistent when you're listening on Zoom than it is on YouTube. It doesn't cycle up and down like your bandwidth does Interesting. on YouTube. Interesting. Um, Leo, and then I'll go. What were you going to say, Chris? Okay. One I'm just going to say super quick. I'll give you a pointer. If you guys haven't noticed, when I, when Alex says, yep, 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 that means he wants to move on. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> okay. So listen for that. Yep, yep, yep. That means stop talking. I got it. Let's move on. Yep, 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 Go ahead, Leo. Uh, to, to that point, this is a super fast talking show. So people who don't talk fast may find it quite uh, difficult to first join. Although I would say it's very, very accommodating once you join. You, we try to make it, you know, as, as, as accommodating as we can. And knowing that, that it is, you are in front of a lot of people. You are in front of 142 people right now. So you do have to be accountable for being ready to do that as well. Because it can be as good as, or as bad <laughs> as you make it. <laughs> Next question. Nigel Dessau of Austin, Texas says, if you have a mix of light sources, what other than trial and error is the best way of working out what color temperature you should set your camera to, to get the best color levels? It's, it, yeah, go ahead, Stuart. Uh, there's three important points here. Firstly is RTFM, because in your manual of your camera, there will be white ba- balance information telling you how to manually set the white balance and most cameras will report the color temperature it's set so you can do it with one light source the other thing to know is for those of you who are working with film and what have you there are color meters exactly the same as there are light meters so you can measure the color coming out of your lights but do remember that as you dim a tungsten light or as you age an led light the color temperature will change mm-hmm. right bill For me, I walk into a set and the first analysis is what can't I control? If there are big windows, I can't control what is flooding in from the outside. That's going to be daylight, 5,600 Kelvin or above. So I have to work with that as my primary. If you're in serious control mode, maybe you can uh, bring in curtains and knock it off. But you have to adjust. If I walk into a store and it's got fluorescence overhead and they're green spiky and I'm only with tungsten lights with me, I realize I have a problem. I'm going to have to do something different. So you have to figure out what you have to begin with before you make adjustments to try to balance and get rid of everything but one tonality of light. Roscoe? Centimeter from uh, Adam Wilt. It has the color. It'll tell you the color temperature right there. It is cal- You can calibrate it to very expensive meters. That is quite, but you have to have access to the expensive meters to do the calibration. You know, and... and- 
fundamentally a, a color chart is super useful. <laughs> like, like if you're gonna do any real work, you need a color chart um, so that you can um, take a look at what those actual colors are doing. Uh, for windows, you can put something like a C CTO on so that you, if you decide you wanna do uh, 3200 and you've got 5600 coming in or daylight, you can, there is film that you can put over those windows, but you do wanna have a, um, professional that's good at doing them otherwise you get a lot of wrinkles and stuff if they're actually going to show up in the in the scene uh, or you can change the bulbs to 5600 <laughs> so we we've gone both ways you change the bulbs in the room change the film on the window um, or you decide that i want it to be warm here and i'm going to show a blue window you know like that's not like that's a creative choice so there's a lot of bits and pieces there but i will say that um having a you know the the a filmmaker will usually use a color meter and a, a video person will use a chart. <laughs> like, like there's just, it's just two different styles of, of measuring what they're looking at. Um, video folks tend, because we've had scopes for so long, film had film. You had to, you had to look at a number and be able to get something out of it that you couldn't see. Um, when, because video folks had scopes, uh, they tend to use them. You know, and so uh, so it's just but measuring them in a good color chart like a chroma demand chart or or something similar or a lot of times if we're if you're shooting for post you can also use something like an X right color checker which I have around here somewhere um, that that you put in front of the, the the footage that you're shooting you can always correct it back to that later uh, but if you're doing live you need to figure that out in real time yep. next question Nigel DeSaw is done, and we're moving on to Edwin R. Ruiz of Chicago. Uh, hey, Alex, thank you and the panel for an incredible sense of community and learning opportunities. How does one join the discussion? The link I receive in the morning is for a webinar. I'd love to one day soon join you all. Well, you, the, the key is the webinar, we actually, what we say we open at seven, we actually open at six. <laughs> so, so, the, so, and, and we, it, it's, it's a little bit of a speakeasy situation where we say seven, but those of you who have listened to the announcements know that at six o'clock, we actually open up the webinar. And so the best thing to do is to come in early. Um, and so, uh, you can come in as early as five. There's hidden down at the very bottom of the email that you get after you've registered is the link to the pre-pre-show. And you can come and hang out with us there and, and ask questions. And we can do little things that we can't do in the webinar, like uh, take over your ATEM from remotely and and uh, and tweak it. And so there's a lot of little things that we can do there. Um, but otherwise, come in between 6 and 6.30. And uh, you don't have to, the one thing that's interesting is you don't have to come onto the panel. You can come in and join us on the panel from 6 to 6.30, see how comfortable it is. And then either go back into the, you know, just say, hey, can you put me back into uh, attendee? There's a, what's odd about, not odd, but interesting about our group is that there's a whole group of people that come at five. Then there's another group that comes at six and then a bunch of them peel off and it switches over for, for uh, at 640 for the, for the actual show. So it's a, it's kind of a constantly moving thing. Go ahead, Sky, real quick. Yes, just physically push the little yellow hand down oh, there yeah. that says okay. raise your hand. That's how yeah. you get into the yeah. panel. And yeah. somebody, go it's, ahead. It's a good point. We don't say that very often, but it, it is raising your digital hand uh, at the very beginning at six o'clock or, or through from six to six thirty. Uh, raise your digital hand and, and then we'll uh, pull you in. That's how you get into our into our little group. Um, next question. JJ McKenna, Santa Venetia, California says, silly suggestion, why use the color green for green screen? And note, wouldn't today be the only one to reveal them without an effect? It's the synthetic <laughs> day approach. Go ahead, Stuart. There's no green in human skin. So you can key against skin and not have it bleed through. And specifically, there's there are three primary colors that, you know, within our video signal, red, green, and blue. Uh, red, as to Stuart's point, there's a lot of that in our in our skin, so it makes it more difficult to separate. Uh, blue was popular for a long time because it um, it tended not the spill tend not to not be as noticeable. Um, and then, uh, but green has not only um, have we gotten good at green, but green has the most of the uh, information within the video signal. So green is sixty percent of the video signal, and red and blue blue is where all the junk goes. So the issue is is that you blue is kind of the hardest thing to key. Um, that, that you could use uh, other than red because of the skin. Uh, go ahead, Mickey, and then, and then Bill. Yeah, for, for digital sensors, the, for most digital sensors, um, the most, uh, there's a lot more sensitivity in green uh, yeah. compared to, to red and blue. But on film, the reason why they typically shoot a blue screen on film uh, is because the first layer on a negative uh, stock uh, that is being exposed as blue, thus that blue is the most sensitive. Yeah, um, uh, Jan? Oh, 
I was off the screen. Uh, I'm on Wirecast now. They give me a choice of a chroma key, a luma key, or a color key. What are the differences? I'm just looking for. I was looking for uh, Jeffrey there. Have you had you? Uh, so the um, luma key is just is just keying the black. So it's basically going to key the black out. Um, a chroma key is kind of the old fashioned. We're just going to select a color and get rid of it. And then I believe the color key is a is a linear key, um, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Is that right, Jeffrey? I think you're right, but so I linear key. Really done too much research. The math the math of a linear key is that you average the red and blue, or average the red and green, depending on what color you're using, and then you um, or you 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 take the average of the two of those values um, within a pixel, and then you subtract that from the from the the color that you're trying to key, and that's just how a linear key works. It's a lot more soft. It's a much softer hand than a uh, chroma key, and so um, so it takes a little bit more skill to use it, but it generally produces a better edge. Um, Courtney, pretty quick. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the reason there is more resolution is because of the Bayer filter that's used in most single chip cameras has double the number of green uh, sens sensitive pickup points as do the red and the green. So you have higher resolution and get a cleaner key with it if you're using a, a single chip camera. Yep. Next question. Ken Jordan of Epsom in the UK says advice on a video tripod and head for a solo shooter in the field. And he's looking at, he or she, no, him, Ken, is looking for nature trails, coastal walks, and so forth. It needs to be lightweight, quick to deploy, and easy to set up on uneven surfaces. And it's to support a fully rigged Ursa Mini, about six kilograms or 13 pounds. I read you should invest the same in a video tripod as you would in quality glass. Generally, I mean, from, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Mickey. Uh, I've recently uh, seen on set the new, uh, I think they call it active line from Sackler. And it's uh, a bunch of them. I don't know if the entire line is uh, carbon fiber, but they have carbon fiber models and they are single stage um, risers on them instead of two. So that makes it easier if you're a one man band, you don't have to unlock two stages to bring them, bring it up and down. Also, another thing you might want to consider is a robust uh, carbon fiber a monopod instead since you're you mentioned that it's for for going on uh, you know nature trails good bill I, I don't own i own three i think or four tripods now and i'm down from a high of six or seven and they were all special purpose that purpose travel and you want collapsibility particularly if you're going to be going through airports and things like that so the more stages you have in a tripod in other words two sections or three sections or four sections of legs typically it lets the tripod be shorter in a packable circumstance so if you're backpacking that can be important as to the material, aluminum and carbon fiber are the two big things. Aluminum is stronger, and it's great if you're going to attach something to the legs, like let's say you use an external monitor or an external sound recorder or something like that. Carbon fiber legs, if you crunch down with a clamp, tend to get broken. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. lightweight carbon fiber, stronger aluminum. There's just a matter mm -hmm. of trade-offs. Go ahead, Stuart. For an Alex price, you can always grab a Vinton, but you will be heavy. <laughs> For a Colin price, have a look at uh, either New Year have a couple, but also Benro BV10. Um, I've got a couple of friends who have used them at budget level. It'll carry the weight of the camera and it's not bad for the price. Um, maybe not as good as a Manfrotto or a Satchler or a Miller, but yeah, yep. good budget one. So the, the, um, you may want to look at something like a Sackler, uh, Sackler SB6, I think, um, is, a, is a pretty good one. It's a little bit more expensive. It's kind of in, in between those, those, two, those two options. Uh, we've actually bought a bunch of the Benros, and they, they work pretty well. The thing that's going to make a difference is the head. So uh, if you're going to do any panning and tilting, you really want to feel that head. And the Sackler is going to – the places that you want to feel for it is how stiff can it get because usually when you want a good pan, you want to actually have it – you're pushing against it a little bit. But you also want to feel that moment when you first start pushing ahead. And my best, the best thing to do is go in and um, check one out, you know, somewhere or rent one, and then you can get a sense of whether it, how 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 you how you like it. Um, but you want to make sure that it doesn't move at all right at the very beginning. So a lot of them will have about uh, five degrees where they'll go. They'll they'll. Uh, you have to get into the push before they smooth out. Um, they'll jump a little bit right at the very beginning. And that's, those are one of the things you want to measure against that. Of course, being able to control the stiffness uh, both in pan and tilt is, 
is important. And then generally you want some kind of ball head. Or, so you want it to be a 75 millimeter, 100 millimeter ball. Um, don't, don't buy things that just go straight up. It's just harder to level it out, especially if you're out, in the, out and about. Um, and, uh, and carbon fiber, if you're going to do hiking, is a must. Like it's, just, it's, just too, it's too much to take steel out there. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, Jeffrey Reyes of Bronx, New York says, VMware parallels virtual box for running Windows on a Mac, which is the preference or is virtualization going by the wayside these days? Go ahead, Leo. Um, so I've always been a parallels user, although I've used all three. Um, however, I would say that it is definitely going by the wayside. I was thinking about it last week, the last time I started up my parallels. Um, because everything I need is now ported. And if it isn't ported, I would actually run the machine in, um, in, in the cloud itself rather than run it on my, my own hardware. Next question. Christian Ortiz is having fun with us, I think, from South Florida. Now that some of you have a playout, B, can you use a silent video clip of yourself and loop it if you have to step away briefly from the panel? <laughs> So, so we, we actually went down the path of having a still up, you know, you, the, you can actually capture a still in the A10 mini and then just put it up there. And, um, and it actually did not turn out to be a great experience because we kept on throwing questions that, like, oh, this, like, you know, this person can handle it and the person wasn't there. So, uh, so we, we realized that, that that didn't work nearly as well as we thought it would, uh, because it actually, um, we'd be like, they froze, you know, like they, and, and so, um, so we've now gone back to black screens or, or something else uh, there other than a, a still or a video of yourself, um, because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's more problematic than we expected. Je uh, Ken and then Jeffrey and then John. And then we'll move on. Yeah, just want to say that this is a video loop. I just want to say that this is a video loop. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeffrey. <laughs> well played, sir. How do I top that? No, I've I've actually done that on meetings before where I've I've done like a five minute recording and then I brought the five minute recording. And you gotta be very careful because if you get called on yeah. and then you're right at that seam, all of a sudden you you got this quick jar. That goes back and forth and people will notice it, but it does work. I wouldn't recommend it too much. <laughs> Go ahead, John. None of my peers will see it, but it works very well in faculty meetings. <laughs> uh, next question. Jan Landy of Las Vegas is in next on the panel with, uh, last night I was watching YouTube TV and the commercials were exceptionally louder than the show. Why is that? And isn't there a law that prevents that? Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, there are regulations for uh, for programming, but only for in a lot of countries, but only for terrestrial uh, broad yep. broadcast. The web is a wild, wild west. So um, it depends if because typical mixes for that are meant for web are are pretty loud because they're trying to line up and compete with uh, commercial music, which is super loud. Um, so if if they upload like for a show, if they upload a a mix that is really designed to be uh, played out on the web, then things should play out evenly. But if they just upload the the broadcast like TV mix for it, then it's they're good. There's going to be a drastic difference. Uh, Bill and then Courtney and then Leo, but pretty quick. Yeah, uh, the FCC some a decade or so ago did the Calm Act, and you can look it up, and that determines how loud broadcasters can be because there are a lot of technical tricks like reverse compression and things mm -hmm. that you can do yep. to make things pop up louder. Courtney, and because of the sorry, because of the specific targeting that YouTube uses for placement of ads, a lot of these roll-ins are coming off of an ad service. So there's no coordination right. as to, you know, the ad from one place may be coming from one place, and the next ad may be coming from another place. So there's no coordination between who's serving you those ads. I think YouTube is slowly replacing most of the the ads from the show with their own ads. I mean, that's kind of what they're. And the money goes back to the you know the right place, but but they are slowly um, replacing those out. Or I think that's the goal, uh, Leo. So very quickly, um, w WLM meter that we've got here, which we're going at minus twenty four. When you click it to the YouTube one, it goes to minus fifteen, and that seems if you run anything on YouTube, you see it's massively the loudness mm -hmm. is much higher on yeah. YouTube than anything else. And I think there's also um, Spotify is another default setting in there. Yeah. Next question. Mark Harder of Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn in New York says, VMix question on Windows Server, Zoom audio selected as line, new tech NDI audio and so forth, get no audio from VMix. External and external two have audio device grayed out and I can only change when using external renderer. 
server only has a Teradici listed for sound output. What's going on? Any uh, ideas? Okay, ignore the can't change it and it's grayed out because that's part of vMix for the internal renders. Uh, that's not the thing. What I think we're looking at here is for Mark, whether he's got his buses assigned to carry through the NDI output or, or the NDI input all the way through to his output. Um, if he wants to hit me up in Discord and what have you, I can always walk through my setup and he can um, have a look at that and see if we've got anything different and maybe we can get a solution for him. Next question. Moving on, Chris Wilder of Lafayette, Indiana says, in building a video wall capable of displaying 300 people at a time, would you go with six streams, screens doing 49 participants each or 12 doing 25? How small is too small to be able to make out Zoom faces? Yeah, go ahead, Roscoe. Well, human resolution is in degrees of arc angle, so how close are you going to stand to the screens is, is the, the biggest issue. I mean, that determines, you know, obviously. So I, I'm not sure we have all the dimensions we need to know to make that determination. In general, I would go with more screens with less people on them just because you'll have more con more granular control over them. So you'll, with 49, you'll have holes and people not doing what you need them to do. It, you'll have more control over who you put in those screens where you may have the ones that are the, the most active or whatever towards the center and the ones that are less active out to the edge. Um, and the more you group them up, the more trouble you'll have doing that. It also means that if you happen to open up the mic to them, it's one of 25 and not one of 49. So there's a bunch of things that that have advantages. So in general, I would say more, if you can, if it's not a budget issue to have or, or a logistics issue to have um, more, I would, I would go with more, uh, you know, in, to, it will give you a lot more control. Next question. Uh, comes from Roger, either Manche or Manche, I'm sorry, um, from Cuomo, Italy, or Como, Italy. In Zoom, what does the signal strength indicator in front of the guest name mean? Is that the signal quality that a specific remote guest is coming in at, or is it my receiving end's signal quality? Theoretically, it is there at the far end. It's 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 what their their connection is. We did see that this morning. My my, but I dropped out. I was my for some reason my landline went down, but my Wi-Fi was fine. And my, I dropped, I was dropping in and out, but I dropped out before the signal changed. Then I said, oh yeah, right. Uh, we just want to remind you that you dropped out. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeffrey. It's important to note that uh, it, it's latent. So the problem happens and then it'll, it'll say, yeah. hey, you're having a problem and vice versa when, it, right. when you're back to regular strength. You're breaking up a little bit, Jeffrey. Uh, John? Uh, the goal is to let the host know that there may be some potential problems with people in the audience, but... Uh, this is, I know, a, a feature in the uh, interface that Alex loves so much. We would love to get rid of it because it doesn't. It doesn't really help us. It, a lot of times, people are having trouble and it doesn't do anything, and then people aren't having aren't having trouble and it starts showing up. So, so in our opinion, it's like it's just not accurate enough. If it was perfectly accurate and it actually gave us something, maybe. But I think what happens for a lot of us is that we just want a clean screen output. It, it, it's been around for a long time, and when I was using Zoom and. 2013 and 14 with our students that were rural, it let us know that something was happening to help them out, but it may have outlived its usefulness. Possibly. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney, real quick. Just a related question. What does the little shield in the upper left-hand corner, the color of the shield and the check mark mean? I think it's that you are, it's encrypted. You know, so encrypted or not, that, 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 the, that the show is encrypted. So if anybody calls into the show, you'll notice that that shield goes yellow. And it will say in the messages that there is an unencrypted connection because I'm allowing unencrypted connections via phone. So um, that it, so it's encrypted. If it's if the shield is green, it means that it's an encrypted conversation. I believe. Go ahead, Leo. And it also does the same if you're streaming. So if you change streaming to certain services, it will go to uh, an orange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You go ahead, John. And if you're interested in what data center you're going through, it tells you that. Next question. Uh, Robert Harvey of Fairfax, Virginia says, are those RWG2s over guys' shoulders? Have you used them on any Zoom calls? And if so, your thoughts? Today was going to be the first day, but yeah, they are these little... There's it was going to be the, the first day. It was, was going to be the first day. Now, why is it not the first day? Because I had to grab a little Micon uh, 3.5 because my oh. DPA is wired for XLR. And so basically I just need to transfer. But yeah, 
This is the box. Um, two of them, 200 of them landed yesterday at our dock. And so I said, give me one. And so I got one of the <laughs> first ones. Uh, I charged That's them overnight awesome. and now they're ready to go. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to test them out. One will probably be for uh, actually going the other way. Uh, I want to be able to listen to the show if I go to, you know, grab a drink or something. I want to be able to continue to listen to it. So I'll yep. use them for in ears. So I'm excited to use them though. What makes and them different than the the previous iteration of the? You get two. two. So one one receiver can handle uh, two microphones. So you can actually so send then it and, in. It, and it can plummet in stereo, Ooh. right? Yeah, left point? well, left and right, mono mono, mono one, mono two, but left and right. Yeah. But it'll show up as stereo. I mean, it'll show up as stereo. But if you sum them, it'll just sum them together. Correct. You know, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Leo. I have expensive friends. Can we can we get a crate of stuff from DVE over to Europe, please? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right, next what question. do you need? Yep. Are they switchable, or so are they a receiver transmitter switchables? Because how could you do uh, one? Of, is it Two receivers and a monitor, or, or a monitor and two receivers. Two two transmitters, one receiver. Two transmitters, one receiver. So how are you going to? Uh, so I take. What happens if you only have out. one mic? What happens if you only do one mic? Does it then just you go use one? Yeah, right. just one to one. Yeah, or you have. But one doesn't come backup, like on one channel. Oh, so it, it, it's centered. It's a center pan all the way, no matter what. Actually, I haven't checked that, but it's a stereo cable, so it's. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's got to be left and right. I mean, mono mono. That's the way everything is. So. I just wonder because I use the uh, AVXs sometimes, and I do one as a mic and the other as a an IFB by just changing it and using the other side of it. So I didn't know if it was this one. This yeah, one you exactly. still need. You still need two receivers, though. If you want to go both right. ways, you'd still right. need the two singles to go back and forth. Correct, but I'm going to use mine mostly for the other way for going. To Although, listen to my if you had two of those, it means that you could listen to Zoom and a talkback channel. You know, so if you had, you had your receiver, you could have two channels coming back to you as the, as the, you know, you could be listening to the show or listening to a talkback channel that was separate. Anyway, you, actually, you I have, have mixed and routed together. So um, I have, you, you, you do, you do, but I'm just saying for some reason, if you wanted to do that, though, you could theoretically have multiple, two different sources if you needed to. Like, so for instance, this, it doesn't make sense here, but what if you had, anyway, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I got I to think through that a little bit. Uh, anyway, next question. Uh, Tommy Chance of St. Paul, Minnesota says, those scopes you are looking, you're using look great, like great tools. What are the top three must have scopes? And please add the prices and what is the best bang for the buck? Audio is not to be forgotten. Oh, the, the, the top three, if we're including audio, gets to be really complicated because there's a couple, there's about three video and three audio, in my opinion. Go ahead, um, Jeff. I'll take one of the three for audio, and that would be uh, a LUFS meter. Do what we're seeing with WLM, that we see a meter of level that is the closest that we have to actual human perception. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead, uh, Bill. I think if I only had one, I'd probably pick an RGB parade because it helps mm -hmm. you balance color, and it also just gives you an idea of overall signal. I, there were seven more I would like to have, but that would probably be my number one video. Yeah, for video, for me, it would be the the RGB parade is probably the most important. Um, you know, I think that if I have an accurate chart, then vector scope becomes important as well. Histogram is nice to have only because I like to show it to people that understand Photoshop. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't mean anything to me, but it is useful for other people to see. Um, for audio, for me, a spectrogram or spectrograph, I'm sorry, spectrograph uh, is is useful for me as well as a leisure zoom meter and levels history, which is what you're seeing here on the Euline um, are, are some of the ones that are really important to me because level history, especially in Spectre, um, you can set all the colors. I think Euline will let you do this. You can set colors so that if it's too low, it shows up as one color. If it's getting close, it's another color. If it's getting, if it's too hot, it's another color. And the reason that's useful is if I'm looking at it across the room, you know, I use a lot of these meters because I have video and audio meters that are 20 rooms or 20 sources that are going out. I need to be able to look over at them and just look at a color and just see if they're all purple, I know I'm good. If or all green, I know that the audio is good. If if they start turning one color or another, I can very quickly go over and and manage it. There you go. Uh, next question. Uh, Gabriel Ung of Malaysia says, uh, looking to light a two person dialogue scene. Um, would you use soft boxes placed at opposite sides to cross light the speakers, or a china ball dropped in between them? 
uh, uh, Ken and Bill. <laughs> yeah, it um, was, well, like he says, it depends. I mean, if, if you see here, I've got two different setups. I've got blue on one side and red on the other. Um, and that's because the, my lights, this one has a grid cone on it, so it's going to be very focused on that side and so the other than there. So, but, um, so really, yes, you can do it with two, but you need to have, you know, uh, a grid on each so that you don't get spill over on one or the other. Go ahead, uh, Bill and then Courtney. I was going to say exactly the same thing he was. It depends on whether I wanted control. If I wanted control 100% of the time, soft boxes with grids, because that's the only way you can get soft light and control off axis spills so you can keep it off a background or something like that. China balls are also fabulous, but they're just big balls of light and you can't really control where the light goes. So you have mm -hmm. to be more careful with placement. Great, Courtney and Roscoe. And if you're cutting back and forth and all of our esteemed editors on this panel can, can vouch for this, if you have a logical source of light, you want to keep the logical source of light in the correct direction for each person. So it would be in the ops, you know, and be on the same side physically of each person rather than cross lighting like that if you don't have an you know an obvious source of light then you can uh, go the other way but i think it mm -hmm. tricks your brain into saying uh, to seeing when you're lighting more from one side keep it straight so that when you're cutting back and forth in screen direction the brain doesn't go wait a minute thought shouldn't the light be coming from the other side so yeah, do a google it. search on motivated light and you'll yep. learn about that it's a really important yep. thing roscoe yeah, it also matters what how you're going to shoot it. We shoot everything uh, film style, which means that we're shooting uh, different angles at different times. So we can move that light. And so you do need to consider putting a china ball in between two people. We've done it often. Looks very good. Gets a nice soft light on both characters. But then when you go to the other angles, you will not have that sparkle in the eye. And unfortunately, if the eyes aren't sparkling, we're not paying attention. Go ahead, uh, Mickey. Yeah, it totally depends on on a lot of factors. Like, what what kind of look are you going for? What how your set is set up and their positions in terms of you know the, the two presenters' positions in space. Um, if you're if you go for the two soft boxes, uh, you know, cross lighting it most of the time, it would end up uh, looking very uh, very soft, very you know. A morning TV show kind of kind of look, but if you just stick a single uh, um, a single china ball in the middle in, in between them, you'll get a relatively soft light, but it's very sidey, and you you will get shadows on the opposite side of the face. One thing that I've I've seen a couple of DPs do that we've worked with is they might have really big soft boxes, but to get back that sparkle that Roscoe's talking about, they use pin lights right over the cameras, <laughs> little 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 pin lights, and it just and you barely see them, but they show up as a highlight on the on the eyes. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. So I have, uh, of course, I have the fabric lights, and the best part about the fabric lights is you can take them off the frame. You can bend them in many different ways. Don't need to have it in the middle. You can have it on the sides, and then you bend the light for uh, for one to two people. And which fabric lights are those? Uh, the long ones the fa are by Fossetin. The shorter ones, the square ones, are by Newer. Great. Next question. Gabriel Ung of Malaysia said, Hi, could Courtney and Alex share what their small B-Link mini PCs are used for and how they have performed so far? Note, what were the specs of the unit you chose? I got the one that Courtney had rec recommended, and I can't think of the spec right now, but it was, I think, an, I want to say an i3. I three, I think, or was it I five? I five. It was like two hundred and some dollars. Um, and Courtney's like, no, not any of those. I can't remember. Courtney put up the link, and I bought it. Um, I've been using it as a compan for running companion, which not companion, um, running uh, Unity, uh, and uh, which is way more than is needed for Unity. And so I, I just have I brought it back to the, my home office because I've been here more often, and uh, I'm going to be testing it with Zoom. Uh, soon, which has been really busy, uh, but but I've been using it for Unity. The, the only problem I had was like Windows drivers, <laughs> Windows drivers in Unity, and my USB pre did not get along. So it mostly is just constantly complaining about them. So I, I was like, okay, I just have to get used to doing something other than what I use Windows for normally. So, uh, which is usually pretty low level. So anyway, so um, uh, but overall, I think it's it's a great little box. And in my mind, I'm doing lots more with it. I just haven't gotten had the time to, to wire it up to do other things. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it's uh, the specs on the box. Here it is here. 
is this particular one is the Gemini M model, which is it's a Celeron 4125 right. <clears throat> Gemini uh, issue. It has four USB 3 Type-A ports, an SD card. It has two HDMI 2.0 ports, so it'll do 4K out of each of them. And it has a gigabit Ethernet, analog, audio, I.O. There it is. And... Uh, I, I use it for video playback. It comes with 8 gigabytes of RAM, and you can get it in 128 gig or 256 gig of SSD uh, internally. So it's quite capably, uh, and Windows 10 Pro license, uh, and for the price, I think the price of the license cost more than the machine itself. And I use it for video playback, uh, and it's nice because I can have two video outputs and my own playback software uh, can play back up to, I don't know, 9 or 18 H.264 uh, decodes on a single screen. So uh, it's very good, has hardware, built-in hardware decoding of the graphics processor and the, and the drivers that come with it uh, handle H.264 encode and decode uh, on the, in the GPU. So, and it's a quad core, that's a quad core processor. It runs about 2.7 uh, gigahertz in turbo speed and I've run mine full out for days in turbo speed and it doesn't have an overheat problem like many of the stick PCs do so because it has an internal fan in it so that's what I know <laughs> it's a great little box I mean I I definitely think it's it's really cool I'm glad that you you brought it up because it's oh, and I, I, and I, I haven't fully analyzed it yet but I, it's, it's it's a good build build it feels like good build quality and when it popped up everything was easy about it except for connecting a USB pre to <laughs> so the, and I might point out that they do make a, a, a whole slew of products that have i5s. and, and Yeah, uh, I, I almost went bigger, and then I was like, I'm just going to stick with what Courtney recommended, because I, I started, I, I went to their site on, on Amazon, and I was like, oh, you could get an i9. And it's like, yeah, and I was like, I almost went down the rabbit hole of, I'm going to spend a little thing on a little PC, and then I almost spent $800 on some kind of massive yeah. little beast. But Yeah, they have Ryzen's, and they have, yeah. you know. Yeah, they, they go a long way. A lot of different ones. And they, they also go down. I've been looking at some of them that are like 130 bucks that yeah. we might be able to use for something like Unity once I figure out how to get it. Yeah, they have know. an Atom processor. It's about 124, including yeah. Windows. So. Yeah. Next question. Uh, TJ Asher in Minneapolis says, since the battery life of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K is so awful, please recommend an external battery solution for me, Gold Mount, V-Mount, Sony F970, something else. Um, go ahead, Bill. So I used to use gold mounts and or uh, V mount batteries, and I, they just I got so tired of lugging around those big units and the big chargers that about maybe eight nine years ago I just said I'm going to get rid of all that stuff and I'm moving to to Sony batteries and I'm going to use one of two types I'm going to use the F 950s which uh, power a lot of stuff and then the M series also I think is actually higher density and a smaller form factor for the same amount of power and I think in almost everything I've run into since then there's a plate to adapt those to the kind of power that I need. Your mileage may vary, but that's been my strategy. Go ahead, uh, Mickey. Yeah, between the gold mount and V-mount, um, I personally like the locking mechanism of gold mount a lot more. It feels way more secure than V-mount. Um, but in terms of what you would, I would recommend you go for is uh, take a look at what you have access to in your community. Like if you already have V-mount, it of course makes sense to just continue on that system or if the the people you regularly work with use gold mounts or v mounts go with what they have so that you can if you need more rent from them or if they need more they can rent from you as well yeah i had a juice box for the black magic camera that i took all over the world and the nice thing about it was i didn't get any trouble in uh tsa which was the pro or you know customs and tsa and everything else and um somehow it's been discontinued so i have no there must have been something wrong with it but i use it all the time because it also has a usb out so it would, i could power a lot of things with it go ahead sky and then and then guy when i bought mine i got it from guy actually and it is a v mount but it also has a hot shoe on the bottom that i can physically just mount it underneath so it's about the same size as the cameras so you're doubling your physical and that that's the one and it's a magical little box because it also has an, an output that connects to the battery uh form factor so it just goes right up into the that's my kit that is exactly my kit right there it's got the usb exits on the side and the little green uh connector there allows me to just plug it straight into uh the wall so i don't i can recharge it it's fairly quick that's the magical part right there it's got the little plate that just 
mounts it right up or you can plug it on the side so you can and what i loved about it was yeah those little batteries that come with the kit what they last what about a second you know life of a fruit fly that sucker will go for like five hours uh mickey oh i'm sorry guy yeah. guy was next or, i guess but guy was showing yeah you. that's that's what i was going to show is the same exact uh quarter it's about 200 it. bucks about 200 dollars 250 i think 239 somewhere in there yep yep, yep. um uh mickey yeah, if ever you do uh end up deciding to go for the uh npf uh, uh batteries from sony uh, I suggest going with uh, a third party because even the 970 from Sony is only, it's, I think it's 47 or 48 watt hours. So mm. uh, I go with like a brand like Hawkwoods, which cre they create the same batteries and the same for form factor with way better cells that go up mm. to, I believe, 98 watt hours. Go ahead, Chris, and then JJ, real quick. Never mind. Uh, JJ? When traveling, I would suggest make sure you know what your wattage output input is. I had half an hour wasted in Barcelona trying to get out of the airport because we couldn't see the text to see what the exact specs were on the batteries. Yeah, pretty much any time you take a battery out of the country, um, you want to, or even on any flight, you want to know everything about the battery. Like, you, because you just have to be able to, to JJ's point, you have to be able to describe it. Um, someone may not know what it is. And we have all kinds of weird batteries, batteries that go into our UPSs, which we have whole printouts for. Uh, this is what this is. And this is why it's okay. And everything else. And, and, you know, so we, we stack up kind of uh, justifying that, but it's not something you buy at CVS. You probably need to have documentation for it. Um, next question. Nick Gutfriend, a good friend of uh, Bedford, New York says, anyone have any experience with the Zap? pad bluetooth hotkey pad for zoom uh it's 49 dollars us for teachers and he has a link there has anyone played with that you know, we're all the, the silence that you hear when someone puts a link in is all of us clicking on it and uh um and and, and trying to fi figure out what is it uh it looks like a little controller for um uh it looks like it basically what you would get for zoom if you didn't have a stream deck <laughs> you know, like that's that 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 that's a. I mean, it's less expensive too. So so it's it's a. Um, it looks like it's just dedicated to to that. Go ahead, Jeff. I would just wonder whether the mute button is the mute on off hotkey, or if it's the space bar temporary unmute that we've found to be unreliable. Or if it's using the API and not and just ignoring all the. If it's not, it, it could be using. I mean, what what the cool version of this would be that it has it's it's a direct link to Zoom. Um, and it, it will do, it, it's not trying to do any hotkeys. So, but we don't know. It's so. a Bluetooth device. I imagine it's probably just mimicking a keyboard. Oh yeah, probably. Yeah. If, if it's just Bluetooth without any, any, anything to install, you're right. Next question. Greg Yotes, Gridley, Kansas to help with audio. Do you think the zoom noise canceling is best or somewhere else in the sound chain? Jeff. Best is to not do any noise canceling at all, not to require any noise canceling. And to do that, you need to be listening on headphones. And yes, Jeff's absolutely right. Having a great environment with a great mic is the best. The second best is to put it is to have a hardware, something in the hardware or pre chain that is going to do it where you have a lot of control. That'd be the second best. Uh, if you don't have those two things, then the Zoom uh, noise cancellation is actually really good. Like it does, a, it does a really good job. It's just a little heavy handed at times. Go ahead, Leo. Yes. Yeah, so, so I would say there's a difference I would argue about noise cancelling and echo cancellation. The Zoom echo cancellation in particular is very, very good because it actually listens to both ways that you're coming in and out. And particularly, you'll be amazed at how many times I have people, when we turn it off, we realize that they've been sending us everything that we've been sending them, but it has dealt with it enough so that the call or the uh, event that we're running can work. Yeah, the, and the noise, the noise cancellation is also very good as well. I, again, in the same way that our this conversation that we have here works really well is almost all of us are wearing headphones, not all of us, but almost all of us, which allows a much more full duplex um, connection. Whereas if you have echo cancellation across everyone, it tends to cancel other people out if there's kind of a cacophony. Um, so um, we do both things, which we don't talk over each other that much. And we also uh, have headphones in, which definitely improves the signal. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, the, the processing, the noise cancellation that uh, Zoom does is definitely like, it's impressive for, for 
you know, for a free piece of, piece of well, not free, mm-hmm. like for a conferencing uh, program. Um, I would probably, if I have access to like Noise Assist or maybe a simple, a simpler version of Cedar, like on the D- DNS2, mm-hmm. I would do it beforehand. Um, but more advanced and more uh, fiddly noise cancellation uh, programs or or devices, I wouldn't uh, put that in your chain at all. If there's no one uh, who is only who's who's so really focused on taking care of the sound, because you don't know what it's doing if you're doing it by by itself. You're typically not listening to yourself unless you have a, a bit of side tone. Yeah, and and it it's that whole great with great power comes great responsibility. When you start using noise cancellation, you start getting yourselves into a a place where you know if you if you can tweak it, you can cause a lot of damage <laughs> really quickly. So just just know that. Uh, go go ahead. Next next question. We're running out of time. Jan Landy, Las Vegas. As we are now more aware of staying healthier, and there are thousands of apps dealing with exercise, nutrition, meditation, fasting, sleep, and so forth, I'd like to know what apps the panel recommends. And uh, go ahead and let Charles in, Mickey. Um, uh, go ahead, Ken. Yeah. Um, so I've got the Apple Watch, the tracking that does for sleep. You can, there's apps to remind you when to take a drink of water, the exercise tracking. Um, and I, you know, I'm a keen cyclist and I've got every GPS unit and stuff on the back. But the fact that this is on your wrist all the time um, and monitoring, it is, uh, yeah, it's worth the investment. I definitely, definitely recommend that. If you're I, definitely, yeah. I definitely use my watch a lot. And, I, and after trying to get my cycle figured out uh, with office hours and work and everything else, I'm, I, I'm um, now getting back into working out before office hours, which is why I get up earlier. And um, uh, and I have found the Apple Fitness is amazingly good. <laughs> like the Apple Fitness Plus. Wow. I was like, I'm going to, I'm just going to, um, do a warm up with a 10 minute, uh, a 10 minute, uh, little workout. Then I was like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> like, like I need to go, I need to go take a rest. Like it was, it's, it's surprisingly, I mean, incredibly well shot too. As someone who does this, who shoots this stuff, it's just, it's like eye candy to look at how Apple I've, I've been watching exercise videos of some version, whether it's beach body or, or other things that I've gone through and, and used and everything else. And the Apple ones are just stunningly well shot, you know, like, and, and so I, I'm pretty sure they must've originated that all in 4k and you know, everything's perfectly lit and the sound is perfect. And I'm just like, Oh, this is, you know, very Apple uh, bill real quick. And then we'll move on to the next. One. I too uh, support the Apple watch and love it. I can't wear it during the show though. Cause every hour it's going get up and walk around. Well, yeah, that's exactly. not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Jeffrey real quick. You can actually mute that by the way. But the one thing, uh, if you haven't updated to the, the latest Apple watch software, do it because the battery just, uh, their battery life just doubled on there. Uh, whereas you know, I have to charge it every day. Now I can charge it every other day, which is great. That's great. Um, yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, the last one I would say is the Peloton app. Even if you don't have a Peloton, I still watch it, and it's so encouraging. Like, I can't believe how much farther I go by listening to the folks on there because it's like you don't want to give up. It's like <laughs> they're encouraging you. You don't want to be that person because you can see who else is exercising. So, and there's a little meter that shows where you're at. So, <laughs> if you don't finish, everybody knows. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. Rough. I like That's it a rough. lot. All right. <laughs> Next, next question. Last question of the first hour. Uh, John Merrill is the last one today before we get to our second hour stuff on a PC with NVIDIA control panel. Any suggested tweaks in that control panel? Turn everything to 11. No, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with that panel. Um, uh, go ahead, uh, Leo. Um, an indirect answer to this is that um, I always use the studio drivers rather than the one, the NVIDIA that you come by default, because the studio driver version is slightly behind, but is much, much, much more stable. And you and it gets rid of 80% of the game related stuff. Uh, Stuart? Um, generally, leave it alone. The NVIDIA settings are actually pretty good and it let it manage and deal with the software that's running. Uh, it works pretty well. Great. All right. We are right on time, shifting gears to uh, our, our second hour, and we're going to be talking about HDR 
monitoring. And uh, Richard, ri this came up because I, I had something else planned for this week. But Richard says I, Richard told me he's got a whole bunch of monitors, and I was like, "Well, oh, this is a good this is a good opportunity to have have a kind of a deep conversation with it." Charles is here as well, and Charles, you know, we for for those of you who don't know, we have we have a, a term of measurement of of cost, uh, you know, and and that's a you know a, an Alex is seven hundred dollars, a Mickey is thirty two hundred dollars, and and uh, a Charles is eleven thousand uh, dollars because of the. Um, uh, of his monitor. So uh, Charles spends a lot on monitors. And uh, anyway, so um, so we wanted to make sure he's part of that conversation as well. Um, so anyway, uh, Richard, do you want to give us an intro to what you're working on right now? Uh, sure. Well, I'm working on a few things at the same time. I'm busy prepping for a show at the moment. And one of the things I've had to do for the last few weeks is test and play with monitors that we might use, not just myself, but the VFX guys, the dailies lab, the what's the director going to look at. Um, and with a really big question being, how do we bring down the price, um, especially considering that some people actually need to look at proper HDR, like myself. So um, I'm the DIT on a project and we're judging some pretty critical content and it is going out for HDR delivery at the end. And so we've looked at pretty much everything we can lay our hands onto. So that includes, for example, the LG CX behind me, which is a 1,300 euro television um, used an adapter to get a video picture into it. Um, I've got a 4K Sony here that I'm testing. I've got a 22 inch 4K small HD OLED that I'm testing. That's not HDR, but has some interesting features. Uh, I've got a, and an ISO 319X that I'm testing. And, and I'm and testing other things too, but they haven't arrived yet, which is a real pity for today. So maybe it, next it week or sometime we can look at them. Fortunately, hey, fortunately, we, we, we can't we can't really see HDR through <laughs> through Zoom. So I, I think that one of the things is I thought because your head's right in the middle of it more more than just seeing the monitors, given that we can't really uh, judge them very well, um, is is really talking about and, and this is if you have questions about HDR monitoring, um, or, you know, in those areas and, and Ray's here as well, uh, who's who's got who's been thinking about this a lot, um, is if you're testing these um, and you have questions about it. Or if you're if you're just trying to think through HDR monitoring or or even just high end monitoring, just go ahead and throw your questions into Makana. But really, what I wanted to to ask because Richard was in the middle of it, and sometimes we, getting a hold of somebody who's like this is all they're thinking about for the last two or three weeks is just a great time to kind of uh, you know milk Richard's brain <laughs> and see what and see what he has to has to offer. So so what are you when you're looking at these monitors, Richard? What are you what are you looking for? What are you trying to what 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 are you trying to decide against? Um, it's a mix of things. It's uh, what's the actual monitor like on set? Uh, does it have fans? Is it noisy? Is it quiet? How heavy is it? Can I mount it? Can I suspend it? Does it have to be on desk? Um, and and those are those are sometimes as important as what sort of picture it puts out because it really decides on whether you can bring it into the space you're working. Or not. So, for example, it would be amazing to have a really big 30 inch um, Sony XH310 or a Flanders CM, uh, XM311. Like, you can't beat the picture on those. But they're big, they're heavy, you can't really have them on set. They have huge fans for cooling, and you just, yeah. And it's, it's a problem. Uh, and the Sony, uh, a friend warned we me, can... has terrible viewing angles. So two people can't look at the monitor at the same time. So it's tricky in an on-set environment. I've definitely no noticed that at, uh, with the Sony 310, which I've spent a fair bit of time in front of, when you turn it on, <laughs> like when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're in, in SDR, it's fine. When you turn it on to HDR, it, the fans all kick in and you, you hear it, it definitely makes a fair bit of noise. Uh, it's not really built for a quiet environment, I don't think. So how how do you how are you measuring, for instance, accuracy when you're looking at these monitors and deciding uh, which one is better than others? And Ray, Charles, and, and other folks, if you want to jump in, definitely uh, jump in as well. So what let us know what 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 are you what are you showing there, Richard? 
Uh, I was holding up a X-Strike Pro that I've got um, sort of plugged into that monitor and the cables are tangled, so I've got to go and untangle it back. But basically, you need something to actually measure the monitors with. And then secondly, yeah, like um, like the, the studio spectro uh, that uh, Ray's holding up, um, where I'm waiting for a bigger spectro to arrive that I can actually use to calibrate uh, the x right at the moment, because mm-hmm. what you don't, most people don't realize is you have to calibrate your color meter to the panels you're looking at. Um, and you have to do that fairly regularly. So, so, so there's that side of it, but I'm also just judging it by eye first. Can I make, and I don't mean I'm calibrating them by eye, I'm, I'm literally looking at them and going, right, is that the result I'm expecting to see? And how can I get that result? And if I can't get there, I'm not even gonna bother cal- calibrating it. Once I get there, I'll start to calibrate the monitors and really line them up. Right. Were you gonna say something, Ray? Um, yeah, um, what I was going to point out is there are two kinds of instruments that are used for setting up monitors. One is called a colorimeter and the other is a spectral photometer. I just held up a spectral photometer from x right The colorimeter is a three channel device. It only has three sensors, a red, green, and a blue. So consequently it has to be calibrated to the type of monitor you're using because uh, different monitors have different red, green, and blue uh, color points. And so a colorimeter is not a universal instrument. You have to, you have to know what kind of monitor you're using it on. Spectral photometer, on the other hand, is a 24, typically a 24 channel device. And when it calibrates, it calibrates from a white uh, standard, uh, a spectrally white built-in standard. And it is much more universal. You don't have to know what kind of monitor you've got uh, in order to use it. And Charles, correct me if if I go astray on all of this, uh, but the spectral photometer costs more than twice as much as a colorimeter, but is a more universal instrument. Charles, you want to comment on that? Go, I second everything that Ray just, just said. Um, one of the reasons why I did go with the Flanders for my main monitor is now they have a program that once a year or twice a year, they will send you a CR100 and a laptop and everything you need, and they will guide you through calibrating your own monitor. Now, before they do that, they will calibrate all the equipment to the type of monitor that you have. So I have an OLED. Um, It's a really nice service, especially since the CR100 on its own, it's about $5,500, you know, so, to add to what Ray was saying, that is just the beginning part, but that is a more specific part of the equation um, where it's not as often seen. A friend of mine was calibrating his XM310 with a CR100 the other day. And, and he tells me you have to do it every 30 days to 60 days to get the most out of those monitors. But the equipment is not widely used because it's so specific you know but yeah it's it's great stuff yeah, richard i mean I, i'll follow on to a few things charles have said has said there one i mean uh i totally back up the flanders thing my baseline monitor is actually going to be a dm250 which is sort of one of their top sdr monitors available um and so so that is my baseline and I mean, in the onset environment, I'm actually looking at more like recalibrating and checking calibrations at least every hundred hours of use. So you're looking at about every 10 to eight days there, which is fairly regularly to have to do something like that if you have 10, 20, 30 monitors. 
Uh, one reason to use a color meter over the spectro in these environments is that it's just way faster to do that with. So if you have used a spectrometer to line up all your color meter to all the panels you have, and you make sure that those correct matrices are loaded for each panel, you can plow through your panels way faster, at least for spot checking, than an actual spectro is going to take. Um, spectros take way longer to read with. So. And, and how are you um, handling the interface to the consumer? Uh, are you using the Blackmagic uh, interface or are you using a different interface to go f to HDMI from an SDI source? Yeah, so for the moment, uh, I'm literally going straight into that LG with a multi-view, just a multi-view for um, HDMI into it. Um, it's kind of a, like a clean and easy way to do it. It's a little bit noisy, but at least in the environment this monitor is in, I don't actually have to worry about that. Um, so, but normally that device, you might even be able to hear it off my earpod, is way too loud to have a black magic like that on set. So you'd have to run as something else. One of the advantage, I mean, one of the reasons I've got it wired up now is that the black magic is actually also doing my SDI routing and loop through into other monitors at the same time so that everything's kind of lined up um, in a similar fashion. Right. Yeah. Cause I think that there's a, the, um, what we've used that, I guess it's the Terranex mini, I think that the 8k or whatever that, that has, that will take the SDI and con and convert it to HDMI. And the other advantage is that it, the calibration actually happens uh, in the black magic. So you can hook your colorometer to the uh, colorimeter to the, um, uh, to the black magic device itself and then measure the monitor. And so the, because mo when you're dealing with a consumer monitor, it's very hard to get it to, you don't have the controls, you know, to, to do it. So this le lets you tie that in. How are you handling that um, on set? Well, um, so in terms of, funny enough, I'm also, I'm also going to be using the Terranex, especially for, we're going to be using some Apple XDR monitors as well as sort of like lower cost ref HDR reference monitors and mm -hmm. running them through the Terranex and loading those calibration nuts that we'll need to use directly into the Terranex itself. Uh, I mean, the Terranex can actually function as your light box. It's just not a very interactive light box. You've got to kind of load what you want in through a menu and it's not and it doesn't have a it, it doesn't have any way to do that over ip does it or do, is that it, no no it, it's it running does. over ip it's got an app that runs over ip so you can okay. set a you can set an ip address and your app can run it and once you're you've got the terranex app open you can even see multiple terranexes if they're on the same so it's, it's, it's a little just bit like, of a drag and just drop. like you can run the multi view yeah and it is a drag and drop um rather than say something like um silver stack or sorry something like live grade Right. where you've got multiple devices and you can literally just load your lat on and off right away across multiple devices so i've got the right and, and like for instance HD i think up here and live grade uh doesn't it interact directly with like an aja uh, hdr um the uh, fs hdr and so i think that you can just it, publish to it yeah you so you can literally load up each channel of the fs hdr as a separate slot the separate settings separate um color pipeline so you can literally have one running in SDR, one running in HDR, something doing some tone mapping. So the FS HDR is fantastic, but it is $8,000 roughly for what is basically a four channel lap box. So I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got two um, of them. <laughs> and it's, and it's noisy as well. Again, it's this noise problem. So yeah. you've got to choose where you want to use it. Um, I've got a bunch of box IOs. I've got a bunch of Teradek colors uh, where I don't need the 4K, um, some ice minis where I do need the 4K. So yeah. And 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 what have your what's your opinion of the of the different monitors that you've had there so far? Um. So basically, you work for what you don't pay for. Um, so for example, Apple XDR. Uh, I don't have it now. I wish I did so I could show you guys. You could, you can pretty much get a usable result on set. There are some caveats that you have to be really aware of. Like for example, there's blooming on high contrast edges. So if you have a white ball traveling across a black background, it's a glowing white ball. 
um, as it travels. At least there's no flicker, which a lot of monitors of the same technology have in the same instance, but there is that blue. And you just have to be really aware of that, especially if you're trying to judge whether that blue is in the monitor or something that's on set that you want to get rid of. And um, so like that's about the biggest fault with it, aside from the fact that to change any one setting, you've got to go into about three different menus on three different devices um, in order to get to the settings you want. So provided you're not having to change your color pipeline on that screen ever, it's kind of okay. Versus what, for example, is on the Sony, where you can jump into the menu on the Sony and you have all of the settings in one place that take three different places and three different devices on the Apple to change. Now, what's the, can you explain to folks, if you go back to that menu for a second? Mm -hmm. So you have, for instance, in the Sony one, you have the, uh, you'll have the EOTF and then you have the transfer matrix. And, and how do you, how do you approach that for everybody? So you have actually three oh. EOTF, color space, transfer matrix, and they're all set to different things. And, you know, how, how are you approaching that when you're setting that up in that Sony? Oh. Start, I'm actually fiddling here, like having this many separate things. So not having the color space in Rec 2020 is already an experiment on my part. Yep. Uh, ideally, you'd act, I would actually want to push a 2020 signal to it. I'd want to use the transfer matrix at 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, the EOTF is basically your the gamma that you're telling the monitor, this is what I'm getting. And I am feeding it a PQ signal, which means it's got to be set to the right gamma. If I feed it any of these right. others, the image below just goes super milky or wrong. So, right. or dull or any of those things. So, and again, the point is it's, it's instant in terms of the change here versus having to flip through a bunch of different devices and go, oh, is that right? Am I looking at the right thing? And you, then you have to have something else as a baseline to reference against going, yeah, that looks right. And well, so, and 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 I'll, I'll, I'll I will admit on YouTube that, that it was I went into the Sony and into the 310 and, uh, you know, on set the first time I, I approached it, we had somebody else come in and work on some of the monitors, but I was just like, I got to make sure it looks like what I'm seeing on set, you know, and so while I, I went to places that I didn't expect to, um, I got to a point where I felt like the monitor was accurate, you know, and I and and it was. Um, you know, for for what we were producing, I was comparing it to our stream, comparing it to our pipeline, comparing it to the different things, and and it didn't. I didn't have it set, and I may have had it set incorrectly, but it just that I knew that the, the most important part for me was that my monitor matched my stream. You know, like like you know, like it's these two things are are so I have some some frame of reference. But I was curious how people are approaching that that process. I mean. Again, what I can do in what I was able to do in the first twenty minutes with the Sony me took yep. me 10 hours the first time I plugged that Apple yep. monitor into yep. Yep. In. and and that's that price and that's literally just the price difference between a 9,000 euro device and a basically a six and a half thousand once you calculate the turn in for that mm -hmm. Apple I mean that's a 3,000 euro price difference and it was 10 hours gone from my right. day so right yeah Charles yeah I would like to Add to what you're saying, Alex, about what you see on set, you want to make sure that you're matching that to when you get back to the grading suite, because that's become a very big thing. Okay, nowadays, when you have a DP and he's holding up his iPhone 12 and he's looking at if you have a 709 monitor, as we used to for so many years, and that looks so so compared to an iPhone 12, now the on set monitors need to be 95% as good as the monitors that you, exactly, as you have in your grading suite because that's where the industry is starting to head. So that well, gap. And, and the reality is, is that in, within a certain range, the, the phones are actually really accurate. You know, Apple, Apple actually has more money to spend than most people on the, on the quality of the monitor. Uh, you know, it's a very small monitor, but the quality of the color, you know, is actually I find pretty accurate. What's your opinion, Charles? It is, it is as spot on as I've seen outside of a 310. It's mm -hmm. so that's why I'm very excited to see what they do with the new iPad Pro. Right. It, if they can get that as close, I'm buying two or three of them just for set use and 
Everything's and I know that we've even taken the last iPad it has been better. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty close. We've given that to, to folks that need to see, just see it because it's better than the monitor they had sitting in front of them, to your point. Um, so um, go ahead, Courtney, and then Stuart. Yeah, I just add, a, you, you said something, Alex, about adjusting the monitor so it, it matches what you see on the set. And I know that you have some degree of colorblindness. How do you account for that in adjusting it? Or does your colorblindness treat both the monitor and what you see live on the set? Can you still equate the two? So I don't. I can't quite figure out color blindness, and uh, so I'm, I'm for those listening. I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of a, a red, red green, you know, the typical uh, red green um, color blindness. The interesting thing about it is, is that I still pick out an awful lot of colors that other people don't see. So I think that somehow my brain adjusts for a lot of it because I still tend to find myself more picky about color than people that are sometimes you know other than charles uh do you know doing color like i'll pick at things that that are green that are red that are those things so it's not like i can't see red and green and i it's it's when they get close together um that i you know that that i have a little i, I haven't quite figured it out now what um so what i'm looking for is not so much what's on the set but what's on my stream so i have this thing where i'm streaming out somewhere and i'm looking at the two looking the same and and again even though i i have uh some you know genetic uh shortcomings i tend to be as accurate or more accurate than most people that i work that i'm working with um uh, except when my monitors miss set wrong um, which happened recently um anyway uh stewart and then ray <laughs> yeah just to charles's point before with the phone monitors and what have you there is a fair bit of conjecture that small hd's 502 on uh, on camera evf is actually using the same screen as one of the iPhones. Uh, it makes sense because it's a screen people are familiar with and the amount that have been made for manufacturing the phones means to the people manufacturing the EVFs, buying those screens is cheap. Right? And it's yep. a good quality screen with good colors. Good colors. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, uh, I want to address color blindness for a moment. I would like to know, Alex, how you know you are deficient in colorblindness. Are you using the dot pattern Ishihara test? Yeah, or that, are the, you? That's the dot. It's the dot pattern. The, the... Okay. Let 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 me tell you something because this is this is very close to my heart. Yeah. Have you ever taken the hundred hue Munzel test? I haven't. Okay, you should find it. it there's one okay. online. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can do it on your monitor take it because okay. let me explain something you may be a very very unique person i know i'm like, a unique person I, I my mom told me that the whole time when i was growing up that i was a very unique person so and i, I said dog on it i'm unique <laughs> Go ahead, well Ray. i am one of these people one of the things that got me into color science is the fact that when i went for my commercial license i took the ishihara test and they said, what number do you see? And I could see two numbers in each plate. And I said, well, if I look at it this way, I see this number. If I look at it this way, I see another. And the deal is, the way that test works is there is a number where the luminance is different, and there is a number where the color is different. All right? And they say, well, you have to pick one. And I'd pick it, and they said, well, you're red, green, colorblind. And I said, well, I don't get it. I've worked with color-coded resistors. I've set up mm -hmm. color televisions. And I don't seem to have any problems. So what's going on? So they sent me to a specialist who gave me this other test. Mm -hmm. He said, you are an anomalous trichromat. There's dichromats, OK? He said, "You, we don't know exactly what's going on, but the quote, normal person sees color difference much stronger than luminance difference. You don't. You see them about equally. And he taught me how to pass the Ishihara <laughs> test. You now, go. if you're colorblind, you can't be taught how to right, do right. it. But he said, look at the background color. If the background color is green, only pay attention to the red number. Okay? Yep. And, and from then on, I was okay. But at any rate, what you want to do, everybody should do this, is look up the Munzel 100U test. Now, mm -hmm. and, and there's one online if you have a good monitor. It depends on your monitor. 
but the actual test costs several hundred dollars. It comes in four little wooden boxes and it's, it's aligning hues in a row. Mm -hmm. And there's a 16 hue test that's smaller and cheaper. Anyway, the, this is an aside, but the hundred hue test has 88 hues in it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Anyway, it will very specifically diagnose exactly what areas you are weak in and so forth. And I pass it. I, right. I am, according to it, I am not colorblind. Well, there you go. Right. I'll check, to check it out. You want to check it out because you might be one of these people. Right. Uh, they're, they're very rare. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I was, I was really glad cause I had, I, I wore my red shirt today and I, you know, I just wanted to know. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Wait, the yellow one? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. Yep. While Ray was talking, uh, I found the color test and the link is now in Mukana and Christian Ortez has found the Ishihara test and put the link in there so everybody can find that. There we go. All right. Back to monitors, which is, this is an important conversation. I let that one roll a little bit because it's, it's, you know, knowing that you, that you are seeing something and how much you should trust it. I, I definitely don't trust my own eyes because of what I do. I have somebody else look, I don't, I don't do the final color unless I'm just looking at scopes. So if I'm color correcting cameras, I'm doing it by math, not by look, um, uh, and partially because of that. Anyway, so now we've got a couple questions that have rolled up. If you've got questions, make sure to ask them. Um, Ken Jordan said, I'm impressed with the Blackmagic Video Assist 7-inch 12G HDR, but how accurate is it? Have you guys played with those at all? Have you played with the uh, 7-inch 12G? Um, Go ahead, Charles. It's good to show you your highlights and measurement as far as color. It's only a guide. So you use that guide. And then when you go back to your main monitor in the suite, then you can compare, do some tests beforehand to make sure that um, they are as close as you need to, uh, to match your, your main grading monitor. And, and Richard, how, like, so you, you want to look at all these colors that um, on set, but when you're when you know that you're going to have someone like Charles in the background that's going to end up doing the color correction, is it most important to know that you're close enough that it's actually you're going to pull it off as opposed to being a hundred percent accurate on set? What what's the importance of the of the accuracy on set? Um, I would say the importance is not drifting and not changing. Otherwise, you get these like constant drift between like week one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you literally, and, and something I do is a fun little like side project during a shoot is always line up stills from every day on a timeline. So I have an actual time maps of the project in sequence as we go. And straight away, you start to see whether you're consistent or whether there's drift when you watch everything through like that. And um, because if we're making decisions and we're pushing on set in terms of lighting, like, so not even getting into color decisions about grading on set and things like that. We're just making lighting decisions and you start having drift um, on your monitors. It's going to affect the overall look of your film and how much work the colorist has to do on the far end. And I think they get, like one of the biggest emphasis we follow is we're trying to minimize the amount of correction work later. So beyond giving everyone an idea of what things might look like on set, um, we're also just trying to cut down the amount of work the colorist has, which leaves the colorist in the DOP more time to just be creative and not spend time leveling cameras and fixing problems. No, absolutely. Yeah, and, and if that answers, if that answers it. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it definitely. I think it definitely helps to be that with everything, whether it's a green screen or whether it's a it's a you know coloring your your shot or or good audio for you know for for post. Uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So if you get, if you, if you're already hitting pretty close to the mark, uh, you, you have a much better chance of getting what you, what you hoped for. Um, Charles Klein said, um, Richard, have you tested the Sony PVM X2400 according to Sony? It's desired to match their HX310. Oh, that's it right there. Go ahead. Um, so I haven't had to transport the two side by side and I really wanted to. Um, it's not going to happen in time for when I have to send this back by uh, band and hopefully I get it back again a bit later. So what happened is uh, band pro uh, down in Munich sent me um, the small HD OLED and the 24 inch, uh, the PVM 2400 and um, just to kind of, because I am looking for an SDR reference monitor, 
um, hence like a choice between a DM250 and the small HD, and then we're looking for an HDR reference monitor, so a choice between the X uh, the um, X2400 and an Apple screen. And um, in terms of matching the XH310, it feels right. It's easy, like the menus are the same and the settings are the same. So from that sort of like point of view, yeah, um, it's got some problems <clears throat> in terms of like the way the backlight system works that make, I think pretty much any DIT feel a little bit nervous using it. Um, and we can go into that. And unfortunately that's what a lot of, a lot of the HDR monitors basically below the $20,000 price range have at the moment is that they're all compromising in order to give you the HDR, they're all compromising on something um, quality wise. So, and, and and so yeah so what what are the yeah what are the comprom compromises to get there? So I'll I'll actually take you into the menu here so I can show you guys the settings and I'm I'm going to jump out of the multi view mode because the multi view mode actually has reduced contrast um, as part of it and I'm just going to jump into <laughs> I will say Sony's very powerful but their menus are horrible like now now that I don't use them as often you're always like really like I, you couldn't I'm yeah. I'm really impressed with this one. It, like it's there's a lot here, but once you're used to it, it's actually pretty navigatable. And I'm, I I wouldn't I haven't had a chance to try it yet, but I think that with that network port might give me a bit of like remote access. Right. Right. So right. Um, it's just sorry jumping out of. And I've got a semi HDR picture up here. A friend of mine's face is blurred. Um, and this is an actual HDR image, which is kind of good to show off. So what I would do with that is I need to jump down here now. And I want to get a little bit of a black reference to actually show you against the monitor in terms of like the level of lift. So when the menu's open, everything's lifted quite intensively. The moment you jump out of the menu, uh, it can snap or change differently. So let's call that pure black on there. This is the backlight level. And let's change to a SDR setting. And instantly the backlight level drops right down on an SDR input. And basically, so it's got several backlight modes. Yeah. And you can basically choose where you want your black detail as well as whether you want to have dynamic contrast on. Now, dynamic contrast sits and tries to adjust the contrast based on content within the monitor. So it tries to bring down the black levels in the areas that are solidly black and tries to get all your like, like bright areas to correct brightnesses. And that's actually what creates the blooming on the Apple monitor, basically, when you have these like really bright areas next to really dark areas and it can't get the dark areas dark enough. And, so, so the Apple monitor is doing what I've actually chosen to switch off on the Sony monitor because I want as little of that as possible, but it does reduce the overall contrast of the monitor versus having something like the XH310, which just has better contrast overall, and or the Flanders, which has amazing contrast, but at a really, really high price point. And, yeah. and yeah, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, I have to thank Richard. This is what makes the job of the colorist and DP once the shoot is wrapped. As you said before, you get to focus on the creativity and the story that you're trying to tell through the images instead of trying to find where things went wrong or shifted. Like the work that's done pre-production, like a lot of the magic is, 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 is really happening there so like i thank you richard because this is not what a lot of people get to see like the 
weeks and work of just testing and retesting and let this and let that. So, so thank you, man. Well, and, and, and it's, it's one of the things that I, I think we do, we try to do more and more here in, in office hours is having all of us understand everybody else's problems, you know, or, or what everybody else is going through to make this work so that we have a better, I think that one of the problems we see a lot is a camera operator or going out to shoot. If, they're, if they don't edit, they don't know what they're shooting for and they don't leave enough head and tail. They don't leave enough this. They don't you know, do, do the setup things. When, once they've edited, they understand what that is. And so the more we can discuss these things, the better, um, so that we understand why they're important. Richard, obviously, and, and Charles understand it, but I think a lot of us going into a film shoot might not, you know, be as sensitive, um, you know, to what those things are. Go ahead, Courtney. And Richard, I might point out that your viewing environment today, unfortunately, for to be able to see you uh, on this call, is probably the worst you could possibly have as a white room with a big window. <laughs> and the question is, do you have uh, normally on set? Do you use an igloo or you know a, a viewing tent to put the DP and the and the uh, director in so for viewing I, I, or I'm dip for in critical studio. viewing? We're in the studio. We're in a very black studio like literally black walls everywhere um, for the crew staging areas. And I have a tent in there. So right. to answer the question, yes, absolutely. Um, and I mean, a, a few people have said, but you're looking at HDR, you're going to need a tent. And, and like, there's this mindset that HDR is always brighter. And with HDR, actually your viewing environment becomes twice as strict because now what happens is that where people have been putting their monitor brightnesses up before in order to like see what's on them and like i run around sticking big not calibrated stickers on the top of those monitors whenever people start doing that stuff um they can't do that on an hdr monitor because the monitor is already at max brightness and you're now controlling the contrast people are seeing more critically so if you look at something that's lit to not be brighter than h like, like than normal sdr if you're looking at dark shadowy moody content it's actually going to look darker than people are used to seeing it uh, on an hdr monitor so um yeah so viewing environment is super critical um but yeah i, I had to sneak off to a quieter office than the studio in order to uh, to jump in today so well we definitely appreciate it Stuart. you had did you have your hand up uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, what do we what do we got, uh, Bill? Uh, what additional features of the 2021 iPad Pros would make them useful for onset color and for grading? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Charles. Um, just as the industry is moving in that direction towards HDR, higher dynamic range, a larger gamut of color. Apple seems to be at the forefront for the masses and in introducing that and getting the general public accustomed to seeing that. So as, as we said a few weeks ago, once you get used to seeing more colors, the way that you do in real life, what we're trying to do is get closer to what your eyes see when you're looking out the window, when you see in real life. Because if you look at a color chart, what we are used to in 709 is very constricted. You know, it's very small to what the eye can actually see. So, so, so if there is a bit of a, of a upgrade to a P3 space, the way that all the Apple monitors are and the iPhones and the iPads, um, um, it's getting us closer to real life, which is essentially what, what it's trying to recreate. As far as trying to grade with an iPad Pro, um, it's going to give you a great picture. I wouldn't suggest it, but that being said, I've said this before, I've been in sessions where the client knows that all their content is going to be viewed on an iPad or an iPhone or something like that, and they will not approve anything until the file is sent to their iPad and they view it there. And that depends on the client knowing the final destination of the um, the, the the content. So, yeah, go ahead, Richard. I mean, yeah, the way we do things on set nowadays. I mean, you have a lot of your reference sort of material is sitting there on an iPad or an iPhone, 
or the director is literally when he's mobile watching the feed on his iPhone or like I'm taking stuff on an iPad to the cinematographer and saying, hi, do you want it this way or do you want it this way? And like, so, I mean, even just on my slightly older iPad Pro, I'm getting enough consistency with the DOP cell phone, which I might have sent a WhatsApp, which is quite a compressed like JPEG to image. And like, we're literally looking at stuff side by side on our two devices and up against the monitors at the same time. Um, so absolutely, like the, the iOS devices are increasingly common in terms of like reference well, devices. And and definitely if I'm in a situation where I'm talking to somebody who where we don't have any calibrated monitors, if the monitors aren't calibrated, I will trust my iPhone over everything that I see. You know, like it is, it's it's not, is it is it as accurate as a Flanders? No, or a Sony? No. But is it is it more accurate than all the monitors that aren't calibrated? Yeah, absolutely. Like it, it definitely hits the color a lot, a lot more accurately, in my opinion. Um, we got more, a couple more questions. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, the next one comes up from Alex Forty Goldner in London. What additional features of the 2021 oh, we already, iPad? We, we did oh, that one. Did I just did that? Okay. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Ruben Marchena of Grand Rapids, Michigan says, do you think that HDR monitors will follow the fates as did 3D monitors? We had a really nice one, really a good 3D monitor. I, I miss it. Uh, anyway, uh, Charles. Uh, um. No, I think they're here to stay. Uh, that's sort of a wrap on that because it's technically closer to the way that the eye sees light, which is a logarithmic scale for the longest time in 709, we were looking at sort of like a linear scope scale, but now we're closer to real life. So yeah, this is, this is, this is not going anywhere. It's just going to get brighter. Yeah, Courtney. And of course, what killed the fate of 3D monitors is the, necess the necessity of wearing glasses or some other device in order to perceive it. And with uh, HDR, you don't need any of that additional hardware, and everybody in the room can see the difference uh, without uh, and, and, artificially. And change. to some level, technologically, it wasn't hard to implement, Near, nearly as hard, to your point, is that just about every monitor you walk into at Best Buy now has a, some version of HDR, and almost all of them have vision at this point. And so, so that's, that's changed dramatically, where 3D was like a thing you had to figure out. Go ahead, Richard, and then Ray. Oh, Richard froze. Um, go ahead, Ray, when we, until Richard comes back. It helps if I turn on my sound. Um, what I want to point out is that I think the thing that's wrong with 3D is in actual fact, we don't use our binocular vision beyond an absolute maximum of 10 feet. When I fly an airplane, I do not use my binocular vision. Okay? Uh, there's nothing, you know. And so the only time 3D is real is when the camera is looking at things on a desk that's in front of you. Well, and there we said when I did a lot of 3D streaming, stereo 3D streaming, and one of the things we tell people is that we can't go much closer than two and a half feet because our, our, our stitching won't work. You know, so you have two and a half feet to about 15 feet. And I said, that's right. the, that's the, that's your 3D world. Anything because they would go. Look, we're going to put it in the back of the room. We're like, what, what are they going to get out of that? You know, like like that's not going to that's not going to help at all. You know, so you, to your point, yeah, it is really that that kind of close up. Um, and and many of the effects in some of the three D movies, they had things that were fifty feet away popping out at you. You know, and and your brain's going something's wrong. Now well, the other the other thing I would comment on HDR is in talking to my, I'll refer to them as non-technical civilian friends, mm -hmm. is they are much more impressed with HDR than they are with 4K. Yeah, yeah, almost everybody, yeah, almost everybody is. I mean, that's definitely been been the impact, and and you know there were so many problems with 3D. I mean, convergence is a, is a big one that we that we ran into is that if you're cutting cameras. When we can, we change our convergence of our eyes all the time, but it happens over time while we're walking, not like changing like this. So when you're changing convergence all the time, it, it, it definitely, you know, you had to think about through, through all those things. Go ahead, Richard, and then Stuart, and then we'll go to the next question. Yeah, I would back up. It's back it up. It's definitely 
like HDR is here to stay. Um, obviously, as TVs get cheaper, I mean, again, the CX is about 1,300, and it's actually something we're definitely going to be putting onto set as a review monitor. It doesn't hit 1,000 nits. It's sitting only at about 600. Um, we'll probably look at SDR most of the time on it, except every now and then where I'll have to push an HDR image to it, maybe. But in general, for like quality control purposes, the HDR makes things much easier. Suddenly stuff that was hiding in SDR ranges, and I'm talking like, like badly wafted smoke, uh, lighting yolks hiding in the bloom of the, of the backlights, uh, like, like physical things on set beyond just errors that you can pick up inside an edge. Um, the HDR is much, much easier to judge. And for, for a cinematographer, if if you're not doing the let's make let's let's blind everyone in every shot sort of approach with it, if you're using it to control your sort of mood and storytelling, it's like that same thing of people not being able to lift the brightness of their monitors. It's, it actually helps deliver something closer to the intent of the uh, cinematographer in the final delivery too, and on set because now you're really getting a sense of like a one-to-one -one relationship with light when you're setting your exposure on your monitor. And that's that's pretty big. If, if you're saying, Do you know what, I don't want this scene to be brighter than SDR. I don't want anything more than three stops above a character. And you can control that into the set and you see the result immediately. You go, Do you know what, let's make every human in this set twice as bright as they were anywhere else in the show. Or let's make that backlight or that flashlight in someone's eyes three times as bright, four times as bright, five times as bright. Like having that sort of power um, once people get used to using it, is yeah, yeah. yeah. storytelling. It's great. Absolutely, story. No, uh, Stuart. Uh, that blinding people with light, Richard. That's a lovely way to describe shooting two stops to the right. But I'd just like to throw a spanner into the works for everyone. Uh, there are some movies in production that are going to force three D to come back, which are the Avatar sequels. Uh, Ray, have you? seen 3d on a lenticular screen well, well, uh, because that's a screen we, you don't we actually need have, glasses on we actually have I'd enough love questions. to see one of those with hdr we actually have enough questions and not enough time but i'm i'm happy to do another hour at some point about 3d so we'll, we'll like like i think we'll just keep the discussion the 3d discussion we, we went off a little bit on a rat hole because we didn't have a ton of questions now we have enough so we're gonna um uh but we'll talk more about 3d in, in the future because it's i don't think it's necessarily gone away especially when you think about vr um that's where it really is impressive um so um anyway let's let's jump into the next question alex forty goldner in london is back with hdr workflow guides are about filming footage on sets and location are there schools of thought on designing graphics and titles for hdr yeah go ahead charles so now the beauty of hdr is that the creators get to choose more of where type or graphics sit within that scale before when you had graphics or like type on screen in 709, um, white type was just set to white and then that was it. But if you do that in HDR, it'll sit at 10,000 nits, you know? So now you get to decide based on what is around, you get to design the whole frame as a whole, the graphics included to the footage. So you have to make decisions on how do you want that graphic to read if you're compositing against anything else? It's very, um, 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 it gives you more work to do, but it gives you more creativity about what image you are presenting to the public. One of the other things that we think a lot about is the brightness of the graphics and um, how they will affect OLED. <laughs> so, so you know, so we're thinking about, um, you know, we oftentimes are shooting, you know, in the you know four hundred nit range, you know, in in inside of these things because if we push those graphics, you know, sometimes if we're going to show them momentarily, we might make them brighter. But if they're going to sit up there for a little while, we we know that we get sensitive to it. Like if I see something sitting for a long time, even if it may not damage the monitor. As an OLED owner, you you look at it, just go, oh, that's going to hurt my monitor, <laughs> and so then you stop paying attention to the story or the or the other line because you're just worried that it's going to screw up your TV. So so um uh so thinking about the graphics as it pertains to the technology is also important. Go ahead, Courtney. 
Yeah, and thinking of HDR, you can have more subtlety in the graphics about shading and contrast, but maybe there needs to be a standard like Title Safe was generated for the old uh, you know CRT monitors, an area that keeps you within the broadcast standard so that people who don't have HDR can still see the subtlety or can see the contrast between things you want them to see and don't there want is, them to see. So. There is a tendency that when, once you start doing a lot of HDR, there is a tendency to throw SDR over the bridge. Even though there's, that's still 95% of the viewers, but you're like, you take that ah, the heck for... with those people. You know, like, like tell them to get, to get a new monitor. Like, we're, 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 move, move forward. Uh, go ahead, Richard. <laughs> you say something, Richard, oh, Richard froze again. Uh, let's, go to, let's jump to the next question. We'll come back to Richard. Uh, it's some guy named Davis in San Diego. Um, and he says, not for looks or creative purposes, but just for base grading. Do you see AI or machine learning taking over some of the initial settings work in the future for color balancing? Right, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, I've been testing. Uh, uh, there's one particular plugin uh, that's been using AI to, to not technically match, but, but perceptually match shots so that you can then get to your creative grade after that. Um, it, it from the creators that have done this work, it, um, it's not going to take over the creativity of grading, but if you're trying to get things sort of in the ballpark, which is the work that used to be for the assistant. So now is this, the assistant. is this color lab or is this? Yes. Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I've been using it for a while um, and it's good just to, get things in the ballpark, but but even they say it's not going to replace a color is, is um, it's only trying to help you get to the creativity, get past the technology so you can just do what you do. Yep, yep, go ahead, Richard. But, um, yeah, I, I would back up the color that thing. I'm super excited about it because it, in terms of what we're doing in that phase of getting stuff ready for editorial, I think it's gonna speed up that process massively um, in the future. And then again, that thing of just saving the colors from the DOP time so that they can spend more time on being creative later. Um, next question. Uh, Roscoe Jones, is there any reason we should care about a display of the IRS uh, infrared specter, spectrum, which the camera may see? Are there any uses for it on a film set? Go ahead, Stuart. Uh, yeah, we should care because a lot of the cameras, uh, especially the cinema cameras, don't have an infrared filter. And when you start using layers of ND filters in front, you can occasionally get a color shift in the infrared. infrared. Uh, Shane Herbert has a great test online that shows some of this happening on early Blackmagic cameras. This thing sitting behind me has an infrared cut filter, so I don't have to stress about it as much, but it does affect the colours that the camera is seeing. One other note, some dyes used in some clothing is invisible in infrared, so you want to make sure your costumes aren't going to be affected by that because that can we were, cause lawsuits. We were, we, were, uh, we were blown away by when we were doing motion capture for all the curtains, we had to choose the curtains to go around our, our, um, our system and our system is all infrared. You have, you have dots that are reflective and it's infrared cameras. And we, t we bought samples for, or not bought or had sent, Ro Rose Brand sent us like 10 different blacks and we just put we put a we put the infrared camera on the ten different blacks, and some of them in infrared were white, and other ones were black, and other ones were gray, and it was amazing the the variance of what we saw. Just in in, in the to the naked eye, they all looked black, but it was super important that we picked black black uh, um, as we as we went through it from a signal to noise ratio, and it was just a it was a really fascinating thing for me. Now yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Well, one uh, good use is to know when your infrared remotes. Are uh, need new batteries because, as you can see, now I can't see that with my eye, but the we can uh, sensor the sensor does pick up infrared, and so most phone cameras or CCD cameras can see infrared. So you can use it to check your batteries in your remote. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. Um, I mean, it's it's something we tend to pay quite a lot of attention to. Like we really push hard for like ND filters that do good infrared cutting, like the Ari full spectrum filters are easily the, some of the nicest to use, but you really you pay for them. So not every production can afford it. 
I would argue that what you save on bad filters, you make up for in post because it's like they add a lot of time and work. And the difference is like our colorist, who's been the same colorist on several projects, um, he he commented straight away the moment we switched to first the um, I forgot the name of them before mm -hmm. the before the RE ones were available. Uh, there was a brand we used, and then IRNDs. when we switched the RE, he commented. No, no, not so. We used RNDs a few years ago, and like RNDs, just straightforward. Like, tend to have quite big color shifts and differences, and you can literally hold up two two of them side by side of the same brand, same set, and you can see four hundred kelvins with a color difference between them, and you can measure up to a stops with the difference between two ND two point ones or two ND one point eights, and and have a variance of a stop between two filters that are supposed to be the same is like pretty bad. Um, yep. So, and again, if you're trying to like match four cameras together in in an on-set environment, and you're forcing colors to do extra work later potentially, so just from that side, so they've got better and better. You've got to be careful. Some of these IR cut filters tend to have polarization artifacts. So if you have two cameras shooting 90 degrees to each other, you could literally have totally different exposures on the grass or the sunny objects in the background to the human skin tones. So you really have to check quite carefully what you're using and what the side effects of them are. Next question. The last one we have in our regular queue, Mickey from the Philippines and here in the panel says, do you concurrently monitor an SDR transform on set as well, or do you leave that to the color suite? Go ahead, Richard. Uh, yeah, I, I'm looking at both side by side. Like I'm looking at both all the time, SDR and HDR versions of the same thing. You've, you've got to be aware of both. You can, you can do very simple, straightforward transforms. You don't have to sit there and actually run two totally different grades on set. The point is you want to know what it's looking like in SDR. And SDR is what we're used to seeing. Like right. HDR is a thing of like, you look at it at the moment, you go, ooh, is that what it's going to do? Is that real? Like, do we need to fiddle? Like, how do we tweak that highlight there? Whereas SDR, you look at it and you go, like, okay, cool. I'm, I know what that means. So. <laughs> Good, Charles. Yeah, I have to second everything that Richard just said. I was going to say the same thing. It's um, um, from a production side, it's very important for you just to get an idea of what those two spaces are going to do for your final delivery. But uh, yeah, I would do that on set and not wait until you're in the grading suite. It's so easy on set to get overwhelmed by all the things that happen on set and not pay attention to the little details. And it's just so much pain on the other end. And, and the hard part is when you don't have someone like Richard man managing all of that, it just takes up too much time too. One of the things that, that I have when I'm, or I had, I, when we, when we first started getting into doing a lot of productions to get a sense of how much I was spending, I had a calculation for all the rent, all the, all, you know, all the rentals, all the people, all the catering, everything else was all stacked up into a, into a Excel file and at the bottom, or numbers file. And at the bottom it would Multi, it would divide it by the minutes during the day. And my and a show that I worked on would be anywhere from a couple dollars a minute to $50, $60 a minute that I'm spending on that, on that show. And these are just live shows. This is not a big film crew. And the reason I did that was so that I could make decisions on set about I would I would go, how much, how long is it going to take to move something out of out of frame or 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 do something? And uh and if it was going to cost me $3,000 to move that, I would go, well, I can roto that. But that's how you made the decision, not just, oh, fix it in post. It was like, oh, if it's only going to take 15 minutes, that's going to cost me X number hundred dollars. I know it'll cost me more to roto it later. So let's go ahead and do it. You know, and so there's, you know, there was like kind of a hard decision, but having that number sitting there in my head for that production allowed me to make decisions. Like we, we used to do what we call burning the train, which was, you know, like, uh, a railroad company realized it was cheaper to burn the trains than to actually fix them. So they just burn them and push them to the side. And so you, you, you we buy printers, we do all kinds of things. You just buy things to make it go away because you just know that that's cheaper than, than trying to get to work it out. Uh, Richard and then Ray. Um, so just in, in direct response to that, uh, it's definitely something that we look at on set all the time. And like the moment you're looking at HDR on set, it's this question of like, oh, are the diamonds and the necklace too bright? Uh, you just wouldn't see it in, H in SDR and you take some dulling spray to the, du to the necklace and suddenly the necklace is, you don't have to do anything digitally to it later. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, it can it can save you a lot of time and stuff that's hard to fix in post. Yep, absolutely. And, and you get to see it 
there done as opposed to oh we hope it works uh, on the other side go ahead ray real quick i'm going to try and be quick i wanted to share very quickly my experience with the apple xdr monitor because i think there's a lot of them out there any rate i got mine the day it was released i ordered it and uh, they promised calibration software to follow which they did indeed send mm -hmm. I got it, and I, I thought, well, which x right monitor or spectro are they going to suggest? The spectros they are suggesting are custom-built $20,000 units, okay? <laughs> and, and, and I went, gulp? No, I hadn't planned on that in the budget. And at uh, right. any rate, I have an Asus HDR monitor beside the XDR monitor, and I calibrate it with my normal spectro and normal profiling and so right. forth. And then I compare the two. And so far, everybody I've talked to about the XDR, and I'd like uh, Richard and Charles's comment on this, I'm told that the XDR is quite stable, that it, it holds steady for a considerable length of time. And it, it, it definitely, all the reports say it comes out of the factory bang on. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Charles. Um, I think as we said before, for the price, you do get a lot, but you have to know you're paying a lot less. So you're making a lot of compromises that at least you should know what you're getting yourself into. Um, if you're going to be delivering something to Netflix or, or Apple or Amazon, your final QC should be on a XM310. Or, or or something, but it is a compromise, you know. So, I go ahead, Richard. I mean, I, I think that's our exact scenario. The final QC, the final grade, the finishing, that's on an X uh, an XH um, three ten from Sony. Uh, I am looking at an Apple monitor on set because I want to see something that maps to what I'm doing, and so it's. Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. All right. I, I am oh, aware yep. of the blooming problem with the XDR. Yep. And that's the yeah. only thing I've run into. Yeah. For most scenes, most typical scenes, I think it works great. That's fantastic. All right. Um, hopefully Richard will come back so we can thank him before he before we uh, we, we leave there. He's oh, there you are. Can you can you see us now? Okay, great. Richard, thank you so much for uh, for hanging out with us and, and uh, talking monitors. It was great. It was great to have you uh, do it. I, it was perfect to have you in the middle of the thought process and have and, and thanks to Ray and Charles who have spent a lot of time thinking about this uh, for being on as well. Um, and thanks to all the panelists and uh, and to all of the uh, and to all of our uh, attendees uh, to be part of the part of the conversation. We're going to keep on coming back to this every once in a while and keep on talking through it. And as, as a lot of us keep moving towards this process, I think it's important for us to really know uh, what's what's important. So, um, so thanks to everybody. Now we're going to jump into the post show and we'll uh, see some of you over there. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow.